Our lives in the modern world today are marked by affluence, abundance, excess, and convenience. This presents a very unique challenge to fasting, but even more so a challenge to feasting. Feasting has a higher importance of place in the church than fasting, yet we very often never discuss this. How do we feast correctly? What are the practices we need to truly experience and enter into feasting so as to be more attuned to Christ and God's will for our lives? We bring clarity to this topic, discuss the challenges we all face, and give you guidance so you can live more abundantly. Stay with us. Welcome, gentlemen, to another episode of the Catholic Gentleman Podcast. We are your hosts, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. And today we're going to talk about a subject that is dear to my heart and stomach, and that is feasting. Uh, one of my favorite things to do. Um, and, and I kid, but it, of course, we all love a good feast. Uh, who doesn't? And the church calendar is actually filled with feast days. And so it's actually a very important part of our faith. So we're going to talk about that in a second. But before we do that, just one more invitation to check out the Catholic Gentleman Plus at CatholicGentlemanPlus.com. It's really uh, the same content you know and love at, uh, with the Catholic Gentleman, just taken to the next level. Uh, we've got high quality lessons in there. We have expert talks from uh, people who are steeped in wisdom and knowledge and want to share that with you. We have a monthly theme, uh, monthly shared prayer and um, ascetical activities that we all do as a, a gentleman's society. Um, there's just a lot of stuff there. and There's going to be a library, library also of digital content, books, etc. Uh, so do check it out. Um, it could really help you in your quest for virtue and growing in your faith. That's what we designed it for, is to equip you as best as possible on that journey. So check it out, CatholicGentlemanPlus.com. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I am so excited about the Catholic Gentleman Plus as well. As you mentioned, next month, we've got the theme of prayer, where we actually have a hermit that's coming on. He's going to teach us men uh, what it truly means to, to have prayer, how to persevere in prayer, and how to grow in that holiness and relationship with Christ that we are all trying to pursue for, for a happier, more um, faith-filled and purposeful life. So uh, definitely head over there and check that out. So as Sam already mentioned, today we're talking about uh, something near and dear to our heart and both of our stomachs. And, and thanks be to God. We talk a lot about fasting on this show because it's so hard for us to do in our affluent society. But in reflecting on this and preparing for the show, I really did realize how incredibly difficult it is in our affluent and excess and, uh, you know, consumption driven society to actually feast rightly and feast appropriately. And so Sam and I thought it'd be really good for us to talk about uh, feasting. And I like to talk about right from the beginning of feasting is why do we as Catholic men or as Catholics feast? And we do it for Christ. We do it for Christ. We do it because Christ guided us and told us to, and because everything that we do goes back to him and goes back to our preparations for the ultimate wedding feast, for the ultimate union with him. And so I wanted to start right out with that. And then a, a scripture verse that I found on Romans 4, 6, that says, he who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. He also who eats eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while he who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. None of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. And I think that pretty much sums up the whole, you know, idea of feasting and fasting and, and how those um, two are so interconnected. And so I'd love to dive in a little bit more and, and um, hear your thoughts on feasting, you know, kind of in general as well, Sam. Yeah, exactly. I, I I liked your point, especially about um, preparing for you know, the Feast of Eternity. You know, you look at uh, the book of Revelation and the Apocalypse, you know, there's this heavenly banquet there that every Eucharist is kind of a foretaste of. 
Um, but really, like uh, eternity is is always depicted as like this kind of festival, and uh, it's like the church prefigures that in time with these feast days. And it's interesting to note in the traditional calendar, uh, the, the Latin Mass calendar, as it's kind of commonly known, um, if there's not a feast day that falls on a specific day, it's called a feria. But in Latin, that means festival. And so, like, literally every day of the liturgical year is a festival or feast day. Like, yeah. it's, it's really kind of, uh, I mean, obviously not Holy Week and things like that, but but there's this um, this sense of rejoicing. Like, yes, we're still in this veil of tears, and yet the church and this liturgical calendar and in all these feast days that are almost every day of the liturgical year, there's some kind of feast day, some kind of observance of some saint. But it's all like this, this message, like, like eternity is breaking into time. And the church is is like already celebrating, even though we're still kind of in this veil of tears, there's still suffering, there's still sorrow. But but we're like, we're already living for eternity. We're already living in the future, if you will, the eschaton, you know, the yeah. uh, what the church fathers called the eighth day, which is like the day of the new creation, you know, and like that's kind of where we're living already. And I think Catholic feasting takes that into account. It it's not about uh, you know, like secular feasts, like you know, the Super Bowl, we're just gonna get our chips and dip and we're just gonna have a big spread. It's all about the here and now, whereas I think Catholic uh feasting is oriented towards the new creation, towards the future. Amen. Yeah, I like that a lot. Well stated. And I liked how you're already bringing in the liturgical calendar because I love reflecting on the fact that the Easter season is longer than the Lenten season, right? So the season of Lent, which is very easy, we all understand as a penitential season, that season of fasting in Lent is then, um, I guess, connected to or, or then led by or after a longer Easter season of feast. And if we look back at the, the Christmas calendar as well, we see that the penitential season of Advent is shorter than the 25th of December through the 2nd of February condomas of the Christmas season that the church in her calendar shows us that our feast is greater and our feast is is given more more merit and more time um than our fasting uh seasons but the two are so interconnected and i do i mean i i think it's it's humorous because you brought it up too i was like like catholics have we can feast for anything there's even a feast for saint john lateran like we can feast for a church <laughs> i mean we we can feast for uh for um for saints and for uh christ and our lady and and all of these different things, but I still don't think we understand how to feast or what actually uh, constitutes a feast. And that's, I do like to, um, uh, to, to talk back on that. And I say, that you know, feasting is something that is has come about all the way back in Scripture, right? We know that we had uh, God who created uh, the er the earth and worked for six days, and maybe we call those the the his days of fast, you know, where he was he was working, and then on the seventh day he feasted, right? And and we see that that close connection even between the words here in English of fast and feast, where there's just one letter difference, you know, that letter E, and um. And we can think about it going back to what you were saying, Sam, of the eternal, right? Of, the, of like, that's that's what it's pointing towards. That's what that feasting is pointing towards. But even in creation account, God worked for six days, we do the same, and then we feast. And we see in the liturgical year, again, going back to that, how all of our Sunday is bookend against a Friday and a Saturday or days of um, of abstinence or days of penance in some way, shape, or form. So it's just throughout the year, and it's a part of what it means to be human as we were created in the image of God. And so, again, the Old Testament brings it up. And, and, and why is this? It's because we as men are body, mind, and soul individuals, and our outward sign reflects the inward reality of our lives, and feasting has to be a part of that inward reality. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, that interior interiority is, I think, one of the biggest things that um, separates secular feasting from uh, Catholic feasting. 
is this sense of meaning that it got, that kind of transcends it. Um, you know, because when we're talking about a feast, like what, where does that word even come from in the Catholic uh, mindset? And it, and really, it goes back to the Gospels when it's always talking about the wedding feast. It all the bridegroom, the bridegroom is coming. You know, there's always this sense of anticipation. Like, uh, you know, all of humanity is like this, these wedding guests. Um, and some some are unworthy and kind of get cast out, as the gospel story shows. But but really, like, anytime Jesus talks about the coming of the kingdom, he's always, like, relating it to this wedding feast. And what is a wedding? It's a covenant of love between God mm. and creation, you know. And it's like, um, that's the festival. It's, it's like the marriage of eternity between God and creation. And that's like what we're, what the, the underlying context behind every Catholic feast, even if you're not even explicit, no one's explicitly talking about that. That's like in the background of like everything that we're doing is like this covenant of love between God and humanity. Um, and the secular world, it's just about tickling your taste buds to an extent, you know, which there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, that's it. Like that's, you know, once once you, you know, sleep it off or like, you know, loosen your belt a little bit or something yeah. like that, that's all over, you know, and uh, we have like this beautiful context in which we're embracing our feasting. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it is significant that, uh, that the whole liturgical year prepares us for these big significant feast days with moments of penitence. Um, with re uh, repentance and um, I don't know what, what do you think the why do you think that is like why yeah do we, why, why can't we celebrate all the time I absolutely and I think we talked about this actually last week or two weeks ago in our summertime episode where this idea of just constant feasting is actually not feasting at all yeah right and Contract, right? Yes, exactly. And to like truly live with purpose, we need that hormesis. We need that tension. We need that, that, um, I guess dissonance and then resolution in, in our lives as men and, 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 and anyone here. And the, the, the church understands that rightly that fasting when done appropriately, when done, um, with, let's say, order and um and a certain degree of rigor and a certain degree of consistency makes the feast all more possible and actually in reflecting on this that exact same question that you had i started thinking about how we substitute excess for feasting today we substitute um kind of uh uh, daily justifications or daily mini feasts, if you will, for what it actually, what actually great feasting is. And it actually takes away from great feasting. And so we've talked a lot about the importance of fasting, the importance of not doing fasting only once or twice a year during Lent or during Lent and Advent, um, but actually throughout the year to really make a Sunday feast all the more enjoyable and all the more meaningful and all the more imbued with the, with with quite literally the life of the church and the life of Christ in all that we do. And so it's funny, and I'm going full circle here, when I was talking and reflecting on how we substitute excess for feasting today, and I do believe it is objectively more difficult for us in modern world to feast appropriately because we actually have to be so much more aware and against the feastings that are sneaking into our day to day. For instance, you know, think 500 years ago, the idea of eating restaurant food on a daily basis, impossible. The idea of, of having sugar and candy and, and alcohol on a daily basis, especially if you were a family or you were trying to lead, it, impossible. And but here we are today where where not only is that possible, but it's actually easy and it's actually convenient and it actually doesn't take much thought. And it's actually what the marketing message has just just flooded us with. And so but not to pit us against the historical world, I started reflecting on and looking back at how how people fasted during Lent in the early church. And we see these rules that Thomas Aquinas laid forth where during 
um, Lent, they would only eat one time a day. They called it the black fast, right? They would eat on every Friday throughout Lent, they would just eat one time a day, bread and water. And then throughout the, every other day, throughout the, uh, the Monday through, uh, Saturday, they would only eat at three o'clock. They would fast. They would do intermittent fasting more than any intermittent fasting individual today, you know, and they would only eat at three o'clock. And so I start reflecting on why did they do that? Well, it's because they understood the nature of the flesh. They understood the, the weakness of the flesh and how if we don't do stuff like that, it's so easy to justify. And like I already called them these little mini feasts, which actually, you know, uh, end up hitting me uh, from time to time. And I have to constantly reflect on. So. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, I think the point about uh, restaurants is really important because um, one of the things I think we've lost in in our feasting, and one of the things that I think is an essential ingredient of true feasting is is uh, the ingredient of love, of mm. care and soul even put into cooking. Uh, you hear about soul food, you know, and you know, the yeah. African American community. But I'm not I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about like you think about like um some of these old old time feast days. You talk about the old world, right? Like uh old world Europe, they would spend days sometimes preparing a feast, like making the desserts, making the food. Um, and it would take a really long time. But it was it was effort. There was love. There was like affection put into that. My kids have these these great um, kids books written by uh, Tommy De P Tommy De Piola, I think that's how you say his name. Okay. But anyway, it, one is Strega Nona, and and she's always she's always putting the uh, she's an Italian grandmother figure. She's like she's always putting into her food the ingrediente secreto or like whatever, like the secret ingredient. Special. And it's always. Three kisses, right? It's love. Yeah. That's the secret ingredient. But I think it's true. Like, you go to a restaurant, you get processed food that's made by a machine mostly. Uh, maybe there's like a tiny degree of human involvement, but they don't know about you. They don't care about you. Oh. But there's this intangible element that's completely missing. And I don't care if it if it tastes exactly the same. If you know your grandma made you biscuits and gravy and you go to a restaurant and somebody who doesn't care about you whatsoever makes you biscuits and gravy there's something missing from that picture yeah. there's something missing mm -hmm. and and so I think an essential ingredient of true catholic feasting is the human touch mm -hmm. um whether that's you know grilling meat for a whole crowd of people or making, you know, a, a special dessert that you pour your heart and soul into and you put the time and the effort and the care into in order to get bring someone delight and joy. Like that's something that's that's intangible, but also something essential to true Catholic feasting. And it's sad to see that like even Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner now, restaurants, stores are selling prepackaged ones. So you don't even have to put in any effort. But you're missing that ingrediente segreto. Yeah. Like you're meeting that secret ingredient that I think is an essential element to Catholic feasting. Oh, well stated, Sam. I, I am grateful for you mentioning that because I was reflecting on what is feasting rightly understood. And I um put down joyful, joyfully, moderately, and liturgically, right? Just as kind of like the three things that I grabbed was that feasting rightfully understood has to be done so joyfully. It has to be done so moderately, right? We're not talking about binge drinking and we're not talking about gluttony, um, which we'll talk about in just a little bit here. But, and um, we're also not talking about willy nilly just because we think, hey, this is the time to eat. Um, but it's actually liturgically, but I love how you mentioned that it does, it has to have that communal element into it, right? It has to have that, that joy into it. And, and maybe, maybe you're single and you, you, for whatever reason, don't have that group of close knit people, right? Feast with the church triumphant then feast with the saints, you know, feast with, feast with those that, um, are still very much attuned to what we're capable of doing and, and how we're capable of, of living together. So again, I'm very grateful for you mentioning that. And, 
Um, and, and I think it, it's, it's, it's just such an important concept for us to, to really go into. And so, in fact, with that, let's talk about a little bit more of like, how do we as men today feast rightly? Because I can think of myself going through the Advent season, a penitential season, getting to Christmas and just being so glad that Christmas is finally here, but for the wrong reasons, not because, um, not because necessarily I am ready to rejoice, but like, I'm just done with the bombardment of, you know, cause the secular world literally feasts from black Friday through, um, through Christmas day. And then Christmas day turns off feasting. And we know we've talked about it on other episodes that basically our, um, I think, uh, the number one days of suicide, unfortunately are right after Christmas because, because that's how the, that's how the world sees it is like, is like the feast and the, and there's no fasting and leading up to it. And so while we're trying to live a penitential season, here in my house, we're being bombarded by these messages and our kids are then starting to bombard ourselves with these messages. And, and we get finally to Christmas and it's just like, thanks be to God. We are here in Christmas. <laughs> and again, not with the right um, attitude. And so I'd love for you to talk about some things you guys have put into place, or maybe just that general idea of how do we, what is feasting rightly understood and how do we as Catholics embrace feasting, um, you know, kind of in the, in a tangible, practical sense i'd love to hear from you on that yeah yeah well um one thing i want to say too is i, I like what you're saying about it joy because i think it's oriented towards joy not so much conjuring joy although i think there is a degree of that yeah but more so uh manifesting that joy that's already there you know christ in the gospels talked about uh, i'm just going to read it because i don't want to butcher it but he you had so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Mm. And I think that's like we have Christ, we have we have him in the blessed sacrament, we have him within us um, by grace. Uh why not be joyful, right? And yeah. so, like true Catholic feasting. It's not about like, well, if I drink enough and I eat enough, I might feel like a little spark of happiness. Like that's kind of the world's attitude. It's like, I'm just going to go pig out, you know, yeah. like just almost an animalistic thing. But like for a Catholic, like it's about manifesting that joy in our relationship with Christ in mm -hmm. our feasting. Like, we're happy. Like, let's show it. And um, and so I think that's part of it, but I also think, like I said, I, one ingredient I think is that personal human touch. I think that is an essential ingredient of Catholic feasting. But one more I want to mention too is, um, a little bit of, uh, letting go of the cult of health to a degree. Um, you know, everyone who knows me knows I'm a fan of GK Chesterton, but I think there's like a cult of health in our modern world where it's like our bodies are put on this pedestal where like i can never ever put anything in my body that could potentially harm it so like you know grandma's candied yams like no i'm not gonna i'm gonna say no to those you know like what did you eat for thanksgiving You're like well you know kale and uh <laughs> you know probiotic uh kimchi or something you know and it's like okay man you were not feasting like just <laughs> let loose a little bit and, you know, there's a hierarchy of values here. And right now, again, expressing that Christian joy trumps uh, perfectly healthy bodies. Like, it's just okay. Yeah. Like, just embrace it. <laughs> embrace it a little bit. I'm not saying you have to eat that way every day. But on a feast day, enjoy yourself. Like, uh, we're looking towards, again, eternity here. Uh, and that uh, celebration trumps, and for that moment, the perfect preservation of your body. Uh, maybe that's not very biased of me, but that's, that's what I believe anyway. It's true and it's hard, right? So for those of us who have been indoctrinated into a certain way of thinking, a cultural way of thinking, a secular way of thinking, a different fad or a different cult, as you mentioned it, it is really hard to, to remove yourself from that. You're right. And that's the way forward. And actually, that's what Christ is calling us to. And I think what I wanted to start out with this, I did start out this episode with, is this idea is that we feast for Christ. We feast with Christ. We feast with the church triumphant. 
And, and in doing so, we don't, we live in the present. We live in that joy. We do so without worrying about, yeah, what, what is this, what's this going to do for me tomorrow? And again, just if you're listening to this, Sam and I are not encouraging you to get drunk or to sin or to do you know, to become a horrible glutton. But if you are, and each of us are in some way, shape or form tied to these, these fads, these cultural norms of a certain degree or place or location, then, then we have to reflect on that and we have to pray about that prior to the feast. And so one way that I know that I have been able to do that is that quite literally when I give up, and I want to thank Exodus 90 for helping me through this a number of years ago, four or five years ago when I first did it, was for me to rightly feast and to like really experience the feast, I would give up things like alcohol and sugar for 40 days, 44 days. I would give it up during Sundays as well. And and I know that I look back at the early church and they absolutely did this as well. But when I was able to give up those things and not have every Sunday just release the fast, release the fast, you know, or whatever abstinence, I guess, in this case on Sundays, it made for that feasting to be all more joy-filled, all more purposeful. I never got drunk or ate sugar to the point where I was, you know, in a sugar coma or whatever. It wasn't like that, but just the, the moderate taste of all of those things added to something to be thankful for. And so in those moments, in those feasts, I was, I was, it added to my thankfulness. It added to my gratitude. It added to the joy that I was able to experience by how much and how can, and, and I guess how directly and the length, if you will, of my fasting that I committed to, or my abstinence that I committed to. And I find myself throughout the year and as humorously as this is, and you've already heard me talk about, you know, feasting for St. John Lateran, right? The the mother church, the church in Rome. Um, I don't actually feast for that. I mean, I, I give thanks to God for that. And I understand that when it comes up to the feast day, but we're not having a celebration here at my family. But I would encourage every family to have a separate liturgical calendar that you are following with your circled feast days. Like my wife and I, all the Marian feasts, we do something very specific on those Marian feasts for our family. Dessert oriented, um, uh, prayer oriented, something celebrated celebratory, you know, later in the day. If we can go to mass, we certainly will on those days, right? Start and bookend your feast days with Christ, but have that separate calendar that your family is going to stick to. So you can really live that domestic church so that you can really live that life of the church. But at the same time, make sure that when there's all these other little feast days, or it's not a feast day for you, as you've decided that you're not having these, as I've called them, micro feasts or mini feasts, right? Because that's what I'll fall into, where I'll have a little bit of candy because that sugar's there and that sugar craving's there. And I'll just a little bit of candy, not as much as I'll have on a feast day, but actually it takes away from the glory of the feast day. And in preparation for this episode, I was actually reflecting on, on birthdays and anniversaries, on feast days within our family. And I could, without a doubt, out without question, count two dozen. I, I mean, we do have a, we have a family of seven, and uh, and then there's the anniversary, you know, for our wedding thrown in there, and then all these major feast days uh, that we do celebrate. There's 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 twenty five to thirty feasts on our calendar year already scheduled, and and honestly that's enough feasting in a particular year for me. And so when I have all these little micro feasts, I take away from those, I can't experience it as much. And so I just wanted to share some of those thoughts as I was uh, reflecting on this. Yeah, uh, definitely those micro feasts. Like, I think it is uh, very important, like to um build build some anticipation um or you just lose the joy of it as you're saying um and again we are our american diets i mean i i heard somewhere you know we uh, most americans gained a significant uh amount of weight during the covid lockdowns like uh, yeah you know, just, 26 pounds i heard yeah average 26 pounds yeah, I, that, that just come out i saw that yeah yeah mm. so it's it's uh, it's really shocking, and and it's like we we eat so much processed junk, and and it's unbelievable, you know, how expensive it is now, and how unhealthy it is for you, and yet, you know, it's it's also so tempting because it's so easy, it's so convenient, like you were saying. So, 
Um, I will just say one more thing that we kind of do. Uh, we also kind of have a cam family calendar of uh, liturgical feasts that we observe. Uh, but but uh, look up some some prayers for that specific uh, saint. Um, I know my wife really likes the um, uh, Catholic All Year Prayer Companion because it oh, has great. a lot of those those prepackaged for you. There's also a a Maria von Trapp one from uh, Sophia oh. Institute Press. Oh, okay. It also has a lot of beautiful prayers and things like that. So if you don't know what to do, like dive into tradition a little bit because people have been celebrating feasts for like two thousand years or more. If you want to include, if you want to include Jewish history even more than that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, draw from that great well of tradition that we have as Catholics. It's a really beautiful thing. It's another thing the secular world doesn't have. I mean, the, again, like the biggest traditions we have is like the Super Bowl or Thanksgiving or something like that. But we have feasts that go so much further back than that. Um, and, and just kind of learn from our ancestors and what they did and maybe try out and incorporate some of those things in your own life. We did one year for St. George. Uh, you know, we read the story to our kids. We have a beautiful like St. George. Uh, retelling of the St. George and the Dragon. Oh, okay. all, of course, all the kids loved that. And then someone dressed up as like St. George himself and the kids all, or I'm sorry, it's the dragon. And the kids all had like little foam swords and they're chasing the dragon around and of course tackled him. And it, it was awesome. So get creative. Yeah, that does sound awesome. No, I really appreciate that. And I enjoy that. So one thing that I do want to talk about, again, we've you've heard us allude to it, or we've been going around it is that it, I don't feel like we also, uh, I guess I feel like we also do not understand gluttony and what that is, right? And this is not permission to be a glutton. If you've heard, right, it's all for Christ. It's all, you know, starting bookending your day with Christ, you know, bringing him in there, using the liturgical feast as a way forward. But I did want to talk really quickly about gluttony because I think that's important, right? We fall into this. I find myself falling into this. And when I read about Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas states that gluttony is eating hastily, sumptuously, too much greedily or daintily is what he said. And so I had to like really break those down because too much is what we all think about, just eating too much, eating two dinners instead of one, feeling sick because you've been eating so much. But what about um, uh, sumptuously? And basically, you know, that's just, you, you'll you only, you know, eat the 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 highest quality you you know hastily right you're gonna just eat too fast you're not paying attention to this part of of your day um greedily right because you want to consume and i think of that joke prayer that my grandfather used to say in the name of the father son and the holy ghost the one who eats the fastest gets the most and um and, and then and then daintily is that it has to be prepared it has to be done in such a way or presented in such a way for me to eat it like all of those things wrap into gluttony and so don't let excess don't let con convenience be your substitute for feasting. Plan the feast, prepare for the feast, and then truly enter into the feast um, uh, with with others and with joyful joyfulness and um, and the other things that we've talked about in mind. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. I love that definition. Leave it to a scholastic to splice me so precisely. That's right. Um, but uh, yeah, the, I think that, um, a modern uh, buzzword um, that I think kind of encompasses what um, St. Thomas Aquinas was getting at there was kind of uh, eating, for lack of a better word, mindfully, like just mm. paying attention and with receiving it with gratitude. Um, even a simple meal can be really delightful if you engage with it with all your senses, like, what does it look like? What is it? What is the color? What is the texture? What are, what are those flavors? And that's another tragedy of fast food culture, I think, is um, we just, even if it tastes really good, we're not even paying attention to it. Like, we're just eat it as fast as you can and get out of here. And I've always loved kind of that traditional European culture of sitting on the patio for two and a half hours outside some little cafe and just like really enjoying your food, enjoying your company, you know, just taking your time with lunch, you know, and then following it with a siesta, like, man, I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, let me just share a little story on that point. I love what you just brought up because 
I was blessed for five, no, three and a half years um, to live next door to a Dutch couple that were um, from, da, um, well, from Holland and uh, yeah, well, Den- <laughs> yeah, and and uh, and they, um, anyways, the phenomenal couple, and they lived exactly what you stated, and they took us out to dinner once. We went on a double date with them, and we took us out to dinner once and we went to this nice restaurant and it was so enjoyable because we ordered uh just uh drinks we were feasting is what we were doing and we ordered drinks and then they took all of our menus and they put them down next to our chairs and every time the waitress came over to ask if we were ready they were like no no not yet like probably when we finish these drinks then we'll be ready for like an appetizer then they very intentionally broke up this meal over the course of three hours And it was phenomenal. We enjoyed each other's company. We never felt rushed. We were never, you know, not quite done with uh, um, our appetizer. And then our food already arrived. And then feeling like we had to switch from that to that because we were somehow inconveniencing, you know, the the wait staff or the restaurant. Ah, that's such an American mindset. And so to to have experienced that. I'm so grateful for you mentioning that because it's so true. And for me, it actually took, I had heard all these things and we had tried, my wife and I humorously would try to, 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 you know, kind of enter in to a a date together that is going to take, but it actually took the Dutch couple to sit there with us and be like, this is what you have to do. You got to put your menu down on the ground. (laughs) It's like, you have to remove yourself from these temptations. And it, it was, it was just a phenomenal time together. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And that is traditional Catholic culture right there. That is. You know, Protestant culture is efficient. It's about moving on to the next thing. It's about making money as fast as you can. Like, I'm sorry, but that's Protestant culture. Yeah. Like, um, and, you know, there's actually a surprising number of movies about this where there's like some frantic, frazzled businessman who's like consumed with making as much money as he can. Then he goes to like the south of France and like a vineyard or something and like, you know, slows down and like learns to enjoy the finer things and like not in like a decadent way, but just in a way of like truly uh, receiving things for all of their richness and beauty. Mm. That's traditional yeah. Catholic culture. And in fact, up until very recently, like, um, you know, the English, like, you know, they would like mock, you know, the, the Spanish and the Italians for their inefficiency and stuff like that. But the point being, like, they knew how to feast. Like, yeah. traditional European culture knew how to slow down, enjoy, appreciate. It wasn't about stuffing yourself, which is not a very enjoyable thing to do if you've ever done it. Uh, but it's, like, it's about savoring, savoring and appreciating. And there's, like, even, like, that slow food movement that yep. some started promoting because he's, like, we we got to stop the frantic frenzy. Uh, yeah. And I think that's that's a great place to kind of wind things down. I agree. I agree. Let's enter in um, uh, so to our quote section. So uh, quotes that 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 we like and quotes that are, uh, you know, kind of uh, reflective of what we're what we've been talking about. And so I'll just lead the way because I had a quote that I pulled out. I actually had two quotes and they're short. So I'm actually going to read them both. I'm going to shake things up a bit here. But the first one is from St. Thomas Aquinas. And he said on Sundays once a week, we start to do what we are called to do forever in heaven, in eternity, namely rest together in God. And I think we could say feast together with God, because that's exactly what he's calling about. And that's what we've been talking about. And so then the final quote, short quote that I grabbed was from J.R.R. Tolkien, um, a, you know, great man and, and writer. And he wrote, if more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world, right? And so I think, uh, all, all recognizable quotes, but ones that just really fit into to how we need to be living. Yes, amen. Well, actually, um, I don't have a quote that really sums it up for me, but I think you nailed it with those two. So I'll let you speak for me at this time. Um, sounds- yeah, it's about fellowship. It's about communion. It's about uh, true joy. So seek that in your feast and you can't go wrong. Amen. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to us. Hopefully uh, you guys check out Catholic Gentleman Plus. Sam, thanks so much for your time. And as we end each of our episodes. Be a man, be a saint.